Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. Sacco and Vanzetti. The names are paired in history as if one. The names of two Italian men tried and executed for murder. The names of two self-acknowledged anarchists caught up in the swirling politics of the early 20th century. Sacco and Vanzetti. The names that have generated controversy ever since their 1921 trial. Today, there is new evidence to suggest that they were victims of a corrupt judicial system. The debate continues as we go in search of history for the true story of Sacco and Vanzetti. On the night of August 22, 1927, Hundreds of thousands of people gathered around the world to protest what they felt was a tragic injustice. In London, Paris, and cities throughout the world, mobs of demonstrators fought police, broke windows, and burned American flags. The reason for the protests? The execution in Massachusetts of Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Both Italian immigrants convicted of murder and sentenced to death in the electric chair. As the hour approached midnight, over 700 patrolmen, state troopers, and mounted police stood guard outside Charlestown Prison, where Sacco and Vanzetti were to be electrocuted. By 12.30 a.m., both Sacco and Vanzetti were pronounced dead. Five days later, Purses carried their bodies through the Italian community of Boston's North End. Some people called it the March of Sorrow. There were about 250,000 people who looked upon the funeral procession. The original intention had been to send the procession in front of the State House as the ultimate act of defiance uh, against the forces of the state. Uh, but the authorities uh, dug up Park Street and put barbed wire and guarded it with machine guns to prevent the procession from going in front of the State House. How could the deaths of two common laborers generate the worldwide outrage that assumed historic proportions? The answer can only be understood with the knowledge of the time and the passionate political beliefs of Sacco and Vanzetti. The early years of the 20th century found America in a strong mood of nationalism. Even before the United States entered World War I, President Woodrow Wilson in his 1915 State of the Union address expressed grave concerns about America's enemies within. Wilson said, I am sorry to have to say that the gravest threats against our national peace and safety have been uttered within our own borders. They are citizens of the United States, born under other flags, who have poured the poison of disloyalty into the very arteries of our national life. Such creatures of passion, disloyalty, and anarchy must be crushed out. When it came to American patriotism, there was no middle ground. You were a loyal American, or you weren't. The whole question of who belongs to the uh, American community and who doesn't was uh, very hot. When you call somebody an American, what that meant is what it means today when you call somebody a wasp. It was during this period that Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti emigrated to the United States from Italy. I think that their expectations were similar to the expectations of most other people who came to the United States around the turn of the century. They wanted a better life for themselves. They wanted uh, to live in a freer society, and so they hoped that America would be a free America, a place where they could flourish and where they could be happy. They were unknown to each other when they came to the United States in 1908. Sacco was 17, Vanzetti 20. Both men settled in Massachusetts, but they lived very different lives. Sacco worked in a shoe factory in Milford, Massachusetts. 
In 1912, he married 17-year-old Rosa Zambelli. A son, Dante, was born in 1913, and a daughter, Inez, in 1920. Vanzetti had a difficult life. He remained single and worked whatever odd jobs he could find, dishwasher, laborer in a stone quarry, and fish peddler. However, both men shared a dream of attaining a better life in the United States. Each grew disturbed by the plight of the American working class, the 12-hour workdays of unfulfilling labor, the low pay, and a general feeling of hopelessness. In letters published after his death, Vanzetti voiced his concern as he watched two young women walking to their jobs in a factory. Here I see two girls of the people going to work. On their pale faces are lines of sorrow and distress. There is soberness and suffering in their big, deep, full eyes. Poor plebeian girls, where are the roses of your springtime? Sacco and Vanzetti met in Boston for the first time in 1917 as members of a small, dedicated group of anarchists led by another Italian immigrant, Luigi Galliani. Galliani believed that life without government, law, or police would allow people to live simply and honestly without class distinctions. They thought that people's instincts were essentially cooperative and people could be trusted. The reason why you found violence or crime or hatred or oppression was because the economic system was unfair and it was a system in which there was exploitation and they wanted to get away from that. However, in order to achieve such an ideal society, anarchists were prepared to resort to violent means, necessary, they believed, because those in power would never voluntarily give it up. Anarchist literature openly published instructions for making and using bombs. A wave of violent activity was begun in 1919 when the Great Steel Strike was broken. Steelworkers' 12-hour days and seven-day weeks remained unchanged. Then, in 1920, Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer conducted the Red Raids, during which thousands of alien radicals were arrested and hundreds deported. Anarchists retaliated with bombings targeted at senators, business leaders, and judges who were involved in the suppression of their movement. Sacco and Vanzetti participated in these activities. One of the leading misperceptions about Sacco and Vanzetti, one that had been um, postulated for decades, was that they were, quote, philosophical anarchists. Sacco and Vanzetti were not of that breed. Sacco and Vanzetti were two militant revolutionaries. Albeit rank and file, nevertheless, they are not pacifists. And the school of anarchism to which they subscribed believed in a revolutionary overthrow of the system. And they certainly did not believe in turning the other cheek. It was during this volatile political climate that two crimes occurred in areas surrounding Boston. The first took place in the town of Bridgewater on December 24, 1919. In what was described as a slapstick, amateurish robbery attempt, four or five armed men tried to rob a payroll truck containing $33,000. One robber fired a shotgun, causing the truck to crash into a tree. But no money was taken, no one was harmed, and the suspects ran away. The second crime, which occurred in South Braintree, Massachusetts, was of far greater consequence. On April 15, 1920, two men emerged from a Buick touring car outside the Slater and Morrill shoe factory. They approached company paymaster Frederick Parmenter and a guard, Alessandro Berardelli, who were carrying $15,000 in payroll money. The two mystery men pulled out weapons and open fire. The guard was hit four times. The paymaster was hit twice. He, he 
seeing what was happening, tried to run across the street and was shot in the back and then shot uh, in the chest. And both men were fatally wounded. The two gunmen jumped back into the Buick and escaped with the entire payroll. Eyewitnesses would later report seeing two or three other men in the getaway vehicle. Local police immediately suspected the involvement of anarchists in both crimes. They become the focus of attention because the authorities were convinced that anarchism and criminality were coterminous, that they went hand in hand. Therefore, if you were an anarchist, you were perfectly capable of having committed this crime. One day after the South Braintree murders, authorities focused their investigation on an auto repair shop where a known anarchist named Mike Boda had left his car. Although the car had no resemblance to the alleged getaway vehicle, police wanted to question Boda and instructed the garage owner to delay him when he came for the automobile. When Boda arrived, he was accompanied by four other men. Stalling for time while his wife called police, the garage owner explained that the car was not ready. Boda and the others grew suspicious and fled before the police arrived. Two of the men were confronted by police on a streetcar. Their names were Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Police, finding weapons on both men, arrested them. Anarchists carrying pistols was ample cause for suspicion at this time, especially in the eyes of local police chief Michael Stewart. This local police chief, not a particularly trained law enforcement official, that anarchists might have committed these robberies. The state police, with far more experience in serious crimes, never thought that. Captain Proctor, the chief investigator of the state police, said from the beginning that the South Braintree crime in particular was the worth of work of professional criminals, and he never believed that Sacco and Vanzetti were the right men. Other historians, however, argue that the work of the murderers at South Braintree could never be interpreted as professional. The criminals were amateurs. Professionals would have gone in and out fast, and that was it, and would have arranged not to be identified. They would also not have bothered to kill these people. They didn't have to. They had the money. Following their arrest, Sacco and Vanzetti were interrogated about their activities the night they came to pick up the car owned by Mike Moda. At a time when aliens were being deported simply for being anarchists, they felt they had to lie. They denied that uh, they were anarchists or socialists or communists for the most part. Uh, Vanzetti said that he was in Bridgewater to see a friend who didn't exist. Uh, I believe that they denied that they knew Boda. Uh, it, it was a big element of the anarchist code that you never under any circumstances betrayed a comrade. Why Sacco and Vanzetti appeared at the garage to pick up Mike Boda's car continues to remain a mystery. Many historians believe they needed the vehicle for some anarchist activity, perhaps to deliver literature, perhaps to deliver dynamite. They were placed in lineups to be viewed by witnesses of both the Bridgewater and South Braintree crimes. Several Bridgewater witnesses said that Vanzetti looked like the man who fired the shotgun in the failed robbery attempt. They could not recall seeing anyone who looked like Sacco. The South Braintree witnesses, however, found Sacco more identifiable. The eyewitness identifications, combined with Sacco and Vanzetti's lies, gave the grand jury cause for indictment. Vanzetti alone was charged with the Bridgewater robbery attempt. Both men were indicted for the murders of the guard and paymaster at South Braintree. In a highly unusual maneuver by prosecutor Frederick Katzman, Vanzetti was tried first for the lesser offense. The evidence linking Vanzetti to the South Braintree crime was virtually non-existent. And the prosecutor Katzman knew this. In order to ensure that he would be viewed as a criminal, they arranged to have him tried on this first robbery charge, this failed robbery charge, uh, with the virtual certitude that a conviction would come in, and therefore when they were tried 
for the South Braintree crime, Vanzetti, notwithstanding a lack of evidence against him for the crime that he is now being charged with, is nevertheless a convicted felon. The judge presiding over both trials was Webster Thayer, a controversial figure who had voiced strong anti-anarchist opinions. Thayer was violently opposed to anarchism. Thayer had presided over the trial of another immigrant for advocating anarchy, uh, in which the man was acquitted. And uh, he threw a public tantrum, which was widely reported in the press. Uh, while he became the object of a great deal of uh, suspicion as to his motives and prejudices, there is no uh, <clears throat> evidence that his conduct of either trial was in any way prejudicial against the defendants. Vanzetti was cautiously optimistic as he got ready for his trial. He and his local attorney, John Vahey, decided to avoid the word anarchy at all costs. They knew that Vanzetti's strongest defense was his alibi for the date of the robbery attempt. Vanzetti's alibi was about as strong as it could be. Uh, he was peddling fish at that time. On December 24th, he reported, he was making special deliveries of eels to all his Italian customers in Plymouth because uh, they had a custom of eating eels in a special Christmas Eve feast. And his customers testified that he made these deliveries. But the prosecution countered Vanzetti's alibi witnesses with the eyewitnesses who had identified Vanzetti in the lineup. Five witnesses said Vanzetti was the man who did it. And perhaps twice as many said, no, he was doing something else. They, the alibi witnesses, outnumbered the uh, eyewitnesses by uh, something like two to one. And it resolved simply down to this. As the judge said, did these witnesses, these prosecution witnesses, take a true visual picture of this man, Vanzetti, or not? Vanzetti chose not to testify in his own defense. I'm sure he declined to take the stand because he did not want to answer questions about anarchism or what he was doing on the night he was arrested. But that probably told against him. The jury found Vanzetti guilty of assault with the intent to rob. Judge Thayer handed down a sentence of 12 to 15 years, unusually harsh in view of the crime. The strategy of Prosecutor Katzman had worked. With the more significant murder trial of Sacco and Vanzetti approaching, Vanzetti was now perceived as a convicted felon. The stage was set for a trial heavily stacked in the state's favor. The same prosecutor, Frederick Katzman, the same judge, Webster Thayer. But the defense committee for Sacco and Vanzetti would add a startling surprise. A West Coast defense attorney famous for his successful championing of radical causes. As the murder trial of Sacco and Vanzetti drew near, supporters of the two men recognized that they needed a powerful lawyer to handle the defense. They chose Fred Moore, a successful leftist attorney from the West Coast. With his expertise, however, came a strong ego and more controversy. Moore was a clever man. Uh, he was an honest man. He worked very hard in the case, but he was a fish out of water in Massachusetts. He was not going to make a good impression there. And he never got along with Sacco at all. He was pretty well prepared, and he was aggressive. But it seems, from the unanimous testimony of almost everyone, that he rubbed Thayer the wrong way from the beginning, and that certainly didn't help. Jury selection for the trial was a long, tedious process. Because they had been charged with first-degree murder, in Massachusetts, a guilty verdict automatically meant the death penalty. The prosecution excused any potential jurors who expressed negative thoughts about such severe punishment. Many believe this selection criteria produced a jury more likely to convict. Early in the trial, jury foreman Walter Ripley left no doubt about his own prejudice. We do know of a statement that Ripley made to a friend of his at a railway station while he was going to the trial in 1921. Uh, a friend of his said that he thought Sacco and Vanzetti were innocent, and Ripley replied, damn them, they ought to hang them anyway. The prosecution under Frederick Katzman relied on three key issues. 
The first involved the behavior of the defendants the night of their arrest. Katzman referred to the behavior as reflecting consciousness of guilt. Consciousness of guilt was a widely accepted term at the time of their trial, and judges and juries and prosecutors often relied on this in order to gain a conviction. The idea, very simply, is that a person who is innocent has nothing to hide and therefore can speak frankly and openly and honestly about what he or she has done. A person who is guilty uh, has something to hide and will reveal that in giving false answers, in not being frank, not being truthful. Katzman told the jury that lies told by Sacco and Vanzetti the night of their arrest were designed to hide the truth about their involvement in murder. Some historians, however, believe they lied to conceal that they were anarchists because they feared deportation. I think it is important to point out that Sacco and Vanzetti were not immediately told what charges they were being investigated for. Uh, they didn't learn that it was for the crimes of murder and robbery until the following day. Some, most of their lies were told in this period. Katzman next turned to the testimony of the 11 people who placed Sacco or Vanzetti in the South Braintree area at the time of the shootings. The defense team countered the eyewitness accounts with alibis. Vanzetti's alibi was fairly good. Uh, he had moved around that day. He was able to bring forth uh, a number of witnesses who remembered uh, seeing him on that day. Uh, Sacco's alibi has been the subject of the most controversy of all because he was not at work on the day of the crime. Had he been, he would never have been charged. The most significant and controversial evidence presented by the prosecution involved the weapons used in the murders. While ballistics evidence is now considered an exact science, it was not so in 1921. As a key part of its case, the prosecution wanted to tie both of the weapons Sacco and Vanzetti were carrying the night of their arrest to the murders of the paymaster and the guard. Prosecutor Katzman claimed that the weapon found in Vanzetti's possession, a 38 caliber Harrington and Richardson revolver, had actually been taken from the guard Berardelli at the time of his murder. We now know, as my co-author William Young discovered in 1977, that that was a completely false claim and more to the point that the prosecution knew that that was a very completely false claim. According to research conducted by Kaiser and Young, Berardelli's revolver had been purchased by Frederick Parmenter, the murdered paymaster. Police Chief Stewart had actually traced the gun to the store where it was purchased by Parmenter. Records showed that the gun was indeed a Harrington and Richardson revolver, but it was a 32 caliber, not a 38. Also, the serial number of the weapon purchased by Parmenter for Berardelli did not match that of the weapon found on Vanzetti. Nowadays, if the prosecution discovered that, they would have to turn it over to the defense, and that would have blown the whole theory out of the water. As it happened, they managed to conceal it, and it sat in state police files for 56 years, literally, until Bill Young found it there in 1977. This is a very important episode, not only because it shows that Vanzetti was not carrying Berardelli's revolver, but because it shows what the prosecution was capable of. Kaiser also believes that the prosecution introduced false evidence against Sacco. Jurors were told that the bullet which killed Berardelli came from a 32 caliber Colt weapon which Sacco carried the night of his arrest. But prosecution witness Captain William Proctor, a police firearms expert, stopped short of stating that ballistics tests proved that Sacco's weapon fired the fatal bullet known as Bullet 3. He would only testify that the bullet was consistent with the type of bullet that would be fired from Sacco's weapon. Kaiser claims Proctor made this statement because bullet three presented as evidence was not fired the day of the murders. What I'm arguing is that it was fired sometime probably between May and December of 1920 at a test range somewhere by some of the police officers uh, working on the case and uh, substituted for the bullet three that had been removed from Berardelli's body. 
In new investigations done since the publication of his book, Kaiser claims to have discovered profound new evidence of corruption on the part of the prosecution. According to Kaiser, during the Sacco Vanzetti trial, police investigators withheld test results which showed that cartridges found at the scene of the South Braintree murders did not match cartridges fired by weapons found in the possession of Sacco or Vanzetti. The question is, what was the prosecution willing to do to convict them? Well, the answer is it was willing to do almost anything. Other historians disagree with Kaiser's interpretation of ballistics evidence. He is imputing ex extraordinarily dangerous actions, as well as uh, vile actions, to the authorities. Everybody is incriminated. I do not see a pure, purely fixed demonstration of guilt in any case. All you have, in effect, are imputations based upon nothing but suspicion of bad character on the part of the actors involved. As the 1921 murder trial drew to a close, Fred Moore refused to make the mistake of his predecessor in the Vanzetti trial. Both defendants took the stand to testify on their own behalf. But the plan turned into a no-win situation. Once Sacco and Vanzetti took the stand, there was no question that Katzman was going to go for the juggler. It was imperative to gain a conviction, to expose both their radicalism, and to play upon the patriotic sympathies of the jurors. During cross-examination of Vanzetti, Prosecutor Katzman focused on the pair's decision to flee to Mexico to avoid serving in the U.S. Army during World War I. Katzman basically sets Vanzetti up, asking him, why did you go to Mexico in 1917? And Vanzetti begins talking about not believing in war, not wishing to participate, and Katzman pouncing on him and saying, but I thought you said you loved America. If you really loved America, why did you leave America in her hour of need? Katzman's questioning of Sacco was even more damaging to the anarchist's case. And the more and more he went into that theme, the more Sacco simply incriminated him by revealing that indeed he was not a patriot, that he was a revolutionary, did not believe in war, did not believe in capitalism. And as far as the jury was concerned, you might as well have, you know, Tie the noose yourself. On July 14th, 1921, the jury deliberated only four hours before reaching a verdict. Guilty of murder in the first degree. While Vanzetti sat in stunned silence, Sacco shouted in Italian, Siamo innocente, I am innocent. Historians who have reviewed the Sacco Vanzetti case point out several main reasons for their conviction. Alibi witnesses were not believed because they were Italian friends of the defendants. The defense team, headed by Fred Moore, provided poor representation, never challenging weak ballistic evidence. And most importantly, at no time in the trial was the jury asked to question whether the murders of a guard and a paymaster fit the pattern of anarchist violence. I don't think that Sacco and Vanzetti would have hesitated to use bombs or dynamite in order to overthrow the existing order. They had no sympathy for capitalists or for those in power, and it would not have violated anything they believed in, even to have murdered these people or, ca or caused their death. But in their mind, that was a very different kind of violence than a payroll robbery, shooting a payroll guard. That was not the kind of thing that Sacco and Vanzetti or people like them were involved in. They didn't do that because that was not a way of creating a revolutionary situation. In the months following the conviction of Sacco and Vanzetti, their defense committee fired Fred Moore and placed their last hopes in the hands of William G. Thompson, a highly respected conservative Boston trial lawyer. Thompson, who reluctantly accepted the case, would later write to a friend about his assessment of Sacco and Vanzetti's situation. It is my belief, based upon a long study of the case, that they had nothing whatever to do with the crime with which they are charged. 
If the men are executed, violent and permanent antagonisms will be created which will certainly not be conducive to social peace and good order and may lead to serious consequences. Early appeals were based on arguments of prejudice on the part of Judge Webster Thayer. Thompson and his associates pointed specifically to anti-anarchist statements made publicly by Thayer. But Judge Thayer was deciding on the issues raised in the appeal. In the Massachusetts system at the time, the judge who conducted the trial also would be responsible for ruling on the adequacy of appeals and whether a new trial ought to be granted. And in 1924, when the defense made motions for a new trial, these were rejected by Judge Thayer. He was, in 1924, attending a football game at his alma mater at Dartmouth. And walking across campus after that game, he hailed a professor of government, Professor Richardson, whom he knew, caught up to Professor Richardson, and then made this infamous statement, uh, did you see what I did to those anarchistic bastards the other day? I guess that will hold them for a while. Of course, Professor Richardson was horrified at this kind of statement coming from a judge in the case and later uh, made public what the judge had said. He was quoted as hearsay. He might well have said it. He did. It is quite credible that he did say some negative things about the defense, if not necessarily about Sacco and Vanzetti. He did have some negative feelings about the great defense lawyer, Fred Moore, who really made the case for the defense and was quite ruthless about it. But nevertheless, that did not show in the court proceedings. And no defender of the defense was able to, to show this at any time in all of the review of this through, uh, into uh, 1927. Following these defeats, Defense attorney Thompson realized that his only realistic chance of freeing Sacco and Vanzetti would be to find the true perpetrators of the South Braintree crime. In 1925, he received a major break. Celestino Madeiros, a Portuguese-American convicted for the holdup and murder of a bank cashier, was in the same prison as Sacco and Vanzetti, also waiting out the appeals process. Madeiros passed a note to Sacco, confessing that he had participated in the South Braintree crime. In an affidavit taken by Thompson, Madeiros said he had been in the suspect automobile with a gang of Italians from Providence, Rhode Island. Although Madeiros refused to name any of his Confederates, he mentioned that they had made their living robbing freight cars near Providence. A gang headed by mobster Joseph Morelli of Providence fit Madeiros' description in every way. Not only had they robbed freight cars, but on the day of the South Braintree murders, most of the gang had been out on bail awaiting trial for another South Braintree crime, stealing shoe shipments from a factory adjacent to the one that employed murder victims Parmenter and Berardelli. The test of any confession like this, as all policemen know, is whether the man confessing can provide previously unknown details about the crime which can subsequently be confirmed as having been true. And Medeiros did that. He said, for instance, that they used two cars in the robbery, not one. He said the cars had been switched immediately after the robbery, and he said where they had been switched. Joseph Morelli turned out to bear a striking resemblance to Nicola Sacco. And several witnesses who had failed to identify Sacco or Vanzetti identified Morelli as one of the bandits. William Thompson tried and failed to get mobster Morelli to confess. So armed with the Madiero statement and supporting evidence, Thompson sought a new trial for his clients. But again, Judge Thayer denied the request. By that time, the whole case had become a point of pride for Thayer and the entire Massachusetts judicial establishment. Uh, they bitterly resented being put under pressure um, by the international community and by left-wingers of all kinds. And they were going to show that in Massachusetts, Massachusetts men decided what justice was. As a last resort, the defense team filed a request for clemency with Massachusetts Governor Alvin Fuller. Fuller appointed Harvard President A. Lawrence Lowell to head a committee to evaluate the case. Based on the committee's work, Fuller came to a clearly defined conclusion. 
I have read the record and examined many witnesses and the jurymen to see from a layman's standpoint whether the trial was fairly conducted. I am convinced that it was. Lowell's handling of the appeal has also generated controversy. We now know that the Lowell Committee was not entirely scrupulous in the way it went about this. That is to say, it had begun drafting its report even before it had heard all of the evidence from Sacco and Vanzetti's side. But uh, A. Lawrence Lowell and the others on the committee, like the jury in the original trial, thought that the conviction was a reasonable conviction, and therefore the death penalty ought to stand. Lowell was a man of, of great and distinguished character who had, in point of fact, put his job on the line to defend a radical uh, uh, member of the faculty and was always known as a defender of freedom of speech. And in fact, the man who defended made a point of, of writing up that episode. So uh, there's no evidence that uh, of this is only the imputation. For the defendants, their only remaining hope was a long shot intervention by the U.S. Supreme Court. When that attempt failed, an execution time was set for midnight, August 22, 1927. During the final months of their lives, Sacco and Vanzetti wrote many letters to friends and loved ones. On August 21, 1927, the night before their execution, Vanzetti wrote to Sacco's son, Dante, who was 13 years old at the time. My dear Dante, I tell you now that all I know of your father, he is not a criminal, but one of the bravest men I ever knew. Your father has sacrificed everything dear and sacred to the human heart and soul for his faith in liberty and justice for all. We were for the poor and against the exploitation and oppression of the man by the man. Be brave and good always. I embrace you. Goodbye, Dante. Bartolomeo. Shortly after midnight on August 22nd, the first death row inmate to be executed that night entered the death chamber. Ironically, it was not Sacco or Vanzetti, but Celestino Madieros, the convicted murderer who claimed to have been involved with the South Braintree crimes. Strapped to the electric chair at 12.02, Madieros was pronounced dead at 12.09. Nicola Sacco was the next to enter the chamber. As the Boston Herald reported, he said in broken English, farewell my wife, my child, and all my friends. As the straps of the electric chair were adjusted, he said to the witnesses, good evening, gentlemen. His final words were, farewell, mother, and viva l'anarchia. Sacco was pronounced dead at 1219. The Associated Press would report that as Vanzetti entered the room, he shook the hand of the prison warden and thanked him for his kindness. Then Vanzetti uttered his last words, I wish to forgive some people for what they are now doing to me. He was pronounced dead at 12.26 a.m. The funeral for Sacco and Vanzetti was an event never before seen in Boston. Thousands filed past the coffins to pay their respects. Hundreds of thousands participated in the funeral procession. Before they were cremated, as was the custom of the day, death masks were cast of the faces of Sacco and Vanzetti. Today, the images serve as haunting reminders of a legacy that they perhaps never intended to leave. The legacy they wanted to leave was a legacy that would inspire people in this country and elsewhere to overthrow capitalism and create a new, just, egalitarian system. And that legacy has not come to pass but there is another legacy, one that they perhaps weren't even aware of, and that concerns their qualities as human beings, qualities of compassion, qualities of love, qualities of integrity that have lasted 
rather than their ideological beliefs or their commitment to a cause. And that kind of a legacy, in a sense, is the more important and certainly the more enduring legacy. Today, the Dedham Courthouse, where Sacco and Vanzetti were tried, still stands without a single landmark or reference to the case that made it famous. At the South Braintree location where the murders of the paymaster and guard occurred, factories have been replaced by a modern commuter railway. On Hanover Street, the only reminder of the Sacco Vanzetti funeral procession is the funeral home where their bodies were prepared for cremation. The debate about the case still continues. The best I can do is say these were the facts, and on the basis of these facts, I believe there's a high likelihood that they were indeed guilty. Our research led us overwhelmingly to believe that they were innocent and that all the major aspects of the case against them were fabricated. History has shown them correct in that the trial was an unfair trial. And the unfairness of the trial had to do with who they were, that is, with the fact that they were anarchists, the fact that they were radicals, the fact that they were immigrants. Today, with more sophisticated forensic testing and changes in judicial and appellate procedures, the outcome of the Sacco and Vanzetti case may have been different. Only by debating such controversial cases can we determine the need for change in our system of justice as we continue to go in search of history.